This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. President Obama became the first sitting president in history to visit a federal prison Thursday when he toured the El Reno Federal Correctional Institution in Oklahoma. After passing through several security gates, Obama stepped inside a nine-by-ten-foot cell and walked through a section called Cell Block B that houses prisoners who are part of a drug rehabilitation and prevention program. He also spent about 45 minutes meeting with six nonviolent drug offenders, which he described during a press conference afterwards. Visiting with these, uh, with these six individuals, um, you know, I've said this before, that when they describe their youth and their childhood, uh, these, are, these are young people who made mistakes that aren't that different than the mistakes I made and the mistakes that a lot of you guys made. Uh, the difference is they did not have the kinds of support structures, the second chances, the resources uh, that would allow them to survive those mistakes. And, uh, you know, I think we have a tendency sometimes to uh, almost take for granted or think it's normal that so many young people end up in our criminal justice system. It's not normal. It's not what happens in other countries. What is normal is teenagers doing stupid things. Uh, what is normal is young people uh, making mistakes. And we've got to be able to distinguish between dangerous individuals who need to be incapacitated and incarcerated versus young people who are in an environment in which uh, they are adapting, but if given different opportunities, a different vision of life, uh, could be thriving the way we are. That's what strikes me. There but for the grace of God. Uh, and, and, and that, I think, is something that we all have to think about. Obama's stop at the federal prison in El Reno comes amidst a broad bipartisan push to end mass incarceration. On Monday, he commuted the sentences of 46 low-level drug offenders. Many of them had stories like our next guest, Jason Hernandez, who was sentenced to life in prison without parole in 1998 for his role in a drug conspiracy starting when he was 15. He was arrested and convicted of a nonviolent drug offense. He was one of eight prisoners whose sentences were commuted by President Obama December 19, 2013. Jason joined us on Democracy Now! the next day after he learned of the commutation. I asked him how he felt after hearing the news. Related. I mean, it's, uh, it's a dream come true. And uh, I'm just, I just hope that this is the beginning of more to come. I mean, I'm happy for what, uh, what, what was given to me by the president. But uh, it's kind of like a bittersweet moment because uh, there's other individuals in here who uh, I believe that were are more deserving than me, and uh, they just didn't they didn't believe that it, something like this could happen. But uh, now they believe, and uh, I just hope that uh, you know the president and other lawmakers, you know, decide to do more for the individuals in here because uh, you know my mother and father this Christmas when they come visit me and my family, my son, they're going to be crying, but uh, it's going to be tears of joy. But uh, at the same time, I'm going to have to look at other individuals, mothers and fathers, and. Uh, kids crying in visitation, and their, their cries are going to be for sorrow. So I just hope, I mean, I, I'm, I'm grateful for what the president has done, but I hope there's more to come. Jason Hernandez had his sentence reduced to 20 years, of which he'd already served 15. He was imprisoned at El Reno, Oklahoma Federal Prison, the prison that President Obama visited on Thursday. He's since been released, but is still technically in custody until this coming August. While he was in prison, he founded the sentencing reform group Crack Open the Door. He now works as a welder at a nonprofit restaurant in Dallas called Cafe Momentum, where he mentors young people training there who were previously incarcerated in 
in juvenile facilities. He joins us from his parents' home in McKinney, Texas. And in Chicago, we're joined by Maya Shenwar, editor-in-chief of Truthout and author of Lockdown, Locked Out, Why Prison Doesn't Work and How We Can Do Better. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Jason, let's begin with you. You were imprisoned at El Reno, and you were um, released by President Obama. Obama just visited El Reno yesterday, first sitting president to visit a federal prison. Your thoughts? Uh, well, my first thought when I heard it was that, and I never thought in a million years I would ever say this, but there was no place that I would rather be than El Reno, FCI, just to, you know, meet the president and to shake his hand and to hug him and uh, tell him I was just so grateful for what he's done for me and uh, for my family and others, and to ask them to keep on doing it for those inmates who, uh, who truly deserve it. And uh, I think it's just a shame that there has never been a president who's talked about citizen reform or prison reform who has never been to a prison. And uh, for him to do that, I mean, uh, that's what's needed. How can you make a suggestion on how to change something if you don't even know what's going inside prison? And uh, President Obama, I mean, that's a great step, step that he's taken. And uh, I'm pretty sure while he was in them, in that prison, in themselves, that he had, had to felt what, you know, what I felt in there, knowing that I was going to die. And uh, hopefully, you know, it had a, a strong impact on him. And, uh, you know, he'll, he'll do some more changes and, uh, and push Congress to, uh, to do the right thing. Uh, and, Jason, you yourself were targeted under the mandatory minimum sentencing uh, laws uh, uh, for drug offenders. Your your reaction now is you're hearing more and more discussion in the Congress and among national leaders about the need to reform uh, these, uh, especially this mandatory minimum, but also this mass incarceration of so many, uh, so many youth in the country. Yeah, I mean, my first reaction and impression to that is uh, it's uh, it's about time. I mean, it's only took almost 30 years for uh, Congress to realize that uh, and society that the war on drugs, which you could actually call a war on minorities, is uh, is wrong. That we've been going about it the wrong way and uh, locking people up for uh, not only a couple of years, but 10 years, uh, decades or the rest of their life actually has an adverse effect on society. And uh, like I said, hopefully the, you know, I read an article the other day where they said the black president that everybody expected has, has finally arrived. And uh, I think that's far, far from the truth. I mean, he's been here. He is, his uh, his uh, view on the criminal system is, uh, is uh, has been set 10 years ago, if not 15, when he was a congressman. J Jason Hernandez. And, uh, uh, um the U.S. has, what, 5 percent of the world's population, 25 percent of its prisoners. One in four prisoners in the world are imprisoned in the United States. One in 99 Americans are in prison, the vast majority black and Latino. How long did you serve in jail? I served approximately uh, about 16 years and eight months, and I'm doing a last year in, a, like, a home confinement. You shared with us a photo of you and other nonviolent drug offenders with long sentences, mostly life without parole, at El Reno before you were released. Can you talk about who's in this picture and where they are today? Uh, one of them is uh, Antonio Douglas. He is uh, he's serving life without parole. He's been incarcerated since 1993 uh, for crack cocaine. Real great guy, one of the greatest individuals that I've ever came across. Uh, he put me in the welding class in El Reno, and probably every year he graduates about 100 inmates from that from El Reno and gets them ready to get a job uh, immediately upon release. There's also Kenny Evans in there. He's also a nonviolent crack cocaine offender serving life without parole. He's a... Uh, uh, He's been in there since 1993. He's uh, When I left, he was a GED teacher. And while at the time he was a GED teacher, he had the most highest graduation rate the Reno has ever had. And uh, there's also a guy in there named Preacher. He's holding the, he had left, he had left. He's not there no more. He's holding the Bible. And they call him Preacher because he 
preaches sermons on Sunday. He has a bigger congregation than the free world preachers that come in. So there's some great people in there. Uh, we're also joined by Maya Shenwar, uh, editor at uh, Truth Out, uh, and the author of Lockdown, Locked Out, Why Prison Doesn't Work and How We Can Do Better. She's joining us from Chicago. Uh, Maya, welcome. Could you, uh, your reaction to the president's visit uh, uh, to a federal prison? Well, I think, first of all, we have to acknowledge that this is unusual and commendable. And it's interesting that we're at a moment in history, a strange moment, where fairly quickly prison reform has become something acceptable to talk about in the mainstream, that a president visiting a prison actually earns him points. I think that the fact that he actually met with incarcerated people definitely was a positive thing. The way he talked about their shared humanity was definitely encouraging. And also, he did speak about the injustice of these long, excruciating sentences that have been prompted by mandatory minimums. I do want to push back on a couple of things he said. One was this giant emphasis that he placed on distinguishing nonviolent and violent offenders behind bars. And the thing that, that he emphasized was kind of drawing this thick line where some people are the people who just do stupid things, like all of us, as he said, and then there are the hardened, violent criminals. And I think drawing this line really causes us to discard huge numbers of people. Really, in state prisons, half of the people behind bars have been convicted of violent offenses. Many of those violent offenses are prompted by the same structural oppression, the same structural racism, structural economic violence that leads to these nonviolent offenses. And I think we have to take that structural violence seriously and not discard these people. I also think it's important to think about them as individuals and think about whether we would want to be judged for the worst thing possibly we ever did. And so I think drawing that line, that's something that's being done across the board with this mainstream rhetoric on bipartisan prison reform, and it's something that we have to challenge. President Obama's push to end mass incarceration comes two decades after another Democratic president, Bill Clinton, signed into law the federal three strikes provision that mandated harsher punishment, often a life sentence, the third time a person commits a felony, a nonviolent drug offense, say. In May, Clinton acknowledged the policy's role in over-incarceration during an interview on CNN. The problem is the way it was written and implemented is we cast too wide a net and we have too many people in prison. And we wound up spending, putting so many people in prison that there wasn't enough money left to educate them, train them for new jobs, and increase the chances when they came out that they could live productive lives. I strongly support what she's doing, and I think any policy that was adopted when I was president in federal law that contributed to it should be changed. More than 2.2 million people are now behind bars, nearly double the number incarcerated when President Clinton took office. He, by the way, also repeated uh, his apology uh, before the NAACP. He spoke after President Obama did. Uh, Maya Shenwar, your response? Well, I think this is an encouraging development. I think that in Clinton's rhetoric and a lot of the discussion around bipartisan prison reform, which has really been spurred a lot by conservatives, the conservative group Right on Crime, the Koch brothers, Newt Gingrich, all of these people who now are very vocally speaking out for prison reform, a lot of what they are talking about is money. They're talking about how much prison costs. $80 billion. We're wasting all this money on incarcerating people. We could be doing other things. And I think while it's important, obviously, that mass incarceration is being challenged, we need to step back a little bit and think about whether this is where we want to place our emphasis. 
because, first of all, a lot of the legislation being proposed in Congress to sort of right some of these wrongs is taking that money that would be saved by decarcerating some people who are in federal prison and redirecting it into what they call public safety measures, like local police forces. So it's, that money isn't being channeled into early childhood education or mental health care or real community resources that would promote lasting safety. A lot of the strategy going on is really about heightening policing in various ways and channeling that money into people who are really at the start of that prison pipeline, the police are the gateway to prison. And we know that police forces are imbued with racism and anti-blackness. They grew out of slave patrols. So I think we, we really have to challenge that idea of kind of easy reinvestment and also just the emphasis on taking dollars from one pot and putting them in the other now that it's no longer acceptable to be spending $80 billion on prisons. Uh, Maya, I wanted to ask you, uh, as more people get released and uh, the, the question of reintegrating for, uh, former uh, prisoners into society becomes a much bigger one. What do you make of the, the movement, the ban, the, the box movement now that you're seeing by companies like Target and Walmart, when the reality is that these companies no longer need people to, admit, to, to, to fill out a box on their employment form because they have so many databases now to determine what a person's history has been to begin with? Right. Right. I think that the Ban the Box campaigns are definitely a positive step. And I've been happy that Obama, over the past week and in recent months, has been talking about right, voting rights and reinstating the voting rights of formerly incarcerated people. I'd also question why people behind bars are not able to vote. I, I think that when we talk about reintegration, reentry, and we think about, well, what does it mean to be a participant in society? And thinking about the employment factors that you mentioned, thinking about how, how people are able to step back into this world, I think that we have to consider, well, what are we doing in the first place that is making it possible for them to enter the prison system? I think sometimes we do kind of overemphasize this idea of reentry, and a lot of money can actually be fueled into reentry that puts a lot of restrictions on people, that puts people in a position where they're answering to a number of folks within the state apparatus and sort of continuing that, that type of confinement. So I think we have to be careful about that. I think we have to make sure to cultivate opportunities for people to really get involved. Um, one thing that I think we have to be careful of as we make this transition, and hopefully fewer and fewer people will be incarcerated, is there's a lot of talk of, oh, well, we'll let them out early and we'll put them on electronic monitors. We'll let them out early and we'll put them on house arrest. All of these things that are still confinement, still isolation, um, we'll let them out early, but we'll send them to a lockdown drug treatment center or a lockdown mental health facility. And so we have to think sometimes about the ways that we are recreating prison, sometimes in our transition efforts. Jason Hernandez, describe your time out of the El Reno prison that President Obama just visited yesterday, but you got out of a few years ago. Well, you know, it's after almost two decades of incarceration, it takes, uh, you know, it takes some adjusting. I mean, going to certain places like a store where there's a lot of people just moving around you, uh, driving. I had to learn how to, my father had to teach me how to parallel park and, uh, and drive. But, you know, other than that, uh, uh, you know, trying to get a job, it was, it was difficult at first. You know, nobody really cared that I had a felony for drugs. They were like, uh, the, you know, the bosses there were like, well, everybody goes to prison for drugs now. And they really didn't, uh, they kind of laughed it off, basically. And, 
And very quickly, for people who are hearing about these clemencies that President Obama has granted more than the last four presidents combined, um, if you could briefly say how you started the process. You described your friends. You said many who were more deserving, but they remain behind bars. How did you apply for clemency? Uh, I filed my own petition on my own, you know, from everything that I learned from, uh, from legal classes. And uh, I prepared it like my life depended on it. And luckily for me, uh, Michelle Alexander uh, connected me, from, who wrote the New Jim Crow, connected me with the ACLU, with Jennifer Turner, and uh, practically got the ball rolling. I mean, uh, without the ACLU and Michelle Turner, I, I probably wouldn't be here right now. And the inmates being released right now would probably still be in prison. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of people to give uh, credit to. We want... Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, oh, well, I just want to say we want to thank you for joining us. Um, we will be checking back with you over time. Jason Hernandez was sentenced to life in prison without parole in 1998 for his role in a drug conspiracy starting when he was 15. He's one of eight prisoners whose sentences were commuted by President Obama in 2013. Um, he was imprisoned at the El Reno, Oklahoma, federal prison that President Obama visited on Thursday. Um, we would like my, uh, Maya Shenwar to stay with us. We want to ask you about the case of uh, Sandra Bland when we come back. We're going to look at the case of um, police brutality uh, in two cases coming up. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a minute.